play for Intel a bit in the past. And then uh, now it's five years I'm a founder at uh, a company called Waitario.com and I've been traveling around uh, while uh, working on, um, on um, Waitario. And um, so in the last uh, six months, I've been rewriting my backend from uh, Heroku to serverless. So I wanted to share a bit my experience about uh, how we see it and how um, other people can uh, use it uh, for some parts of their stack. So today I'm going to uh, speak first about um, like a general evolution of like servers. This is just like really an overview, it's nothing uh, technical, it's just like to put in context later uh, what is the serverless and why serverless is kind of like the, the next step in the evolution of uh, backends. And then I'm going to show a practical example on how to create like a hello world application, a hello world web app using Amazon Lambda and the serverless framework. And then I'm going to give some tips on how to do um, like if you guys want to actually use a um, to use a serverless, how you can start to use it in production in your own company by not having to rewrite everything, but just like use it in uh, tiny bits uh, of your stack where it makes sense. So uh, let's start with like the server uh, evolution. And so I'm gonna talk like very simply one by one about uh, how things change from just like hobby servers to on-premise servers to data center and then the cloud. So hobby server is essentially anytime you just like get an old computer and then you just put it in your house or you just like put it in the garage of your parents and then you connect it to the internet and then you just install a program like Apache and then you just uh, serving HTML files and then bam you know you got a server there it's already like this is the basic like the the smallest version that you can do ever and then after this if you if you're actually working on a company in the past, and like almost no one is doing it anymore, but you would just have one or two on-premise servers. So they would still be like desktop computers, and then you would still have them in the office, all right? So after this, of course, uh, you're gonna need to like scale. And so before or later, you're gonna have like a data center. So a data center is really, I mean, at the end of the day, is just like a bunch of uh, faster computers. Uh, and then you have them either in your building or you put them in a facility in a building far away and then you connect them to the internet and then you then connect remotely to them and you just like SSH inside of them and then you have them run a program like a, a web server that serves HTML pages. So then it came the concept of cloud, you know, it's kind of like a people in the field that kind of like don't like sometimes the cloud world because it's just like a magic world, right? I mean, we already had the cloud. It's just like the data centers now are called the cloud and like it's kind of like a marketing uh, hype, but uh, it's just like nicer to say cloud to your clients. And uh, so then the problem is this once, once you have all these servers, uh, before or later you're going to run into a problem, right? So you have, uh, let's say that you have like one server machine and then uh, this server has four gigabyte of ram okay and then for simplicity we don't consider all the other parameters we just consider the ram memory <clears throat> and so then you have one of your developers in your company and then he comes to you and uh, for example alice come to you and says that she needs to host a website and then you see that this website is gonna take like two gigabyte of your ram you know so it's easy you know you just take this website and then you put it in the four gigabyte server. And then Bob comes along and then he says, oh, I have this other you know, website. And then he's like, it takes one gigabyte of RAM to run. All right, and then you add it. And now it, it takes a three gigabyte of your four gigabyte RAM. And then uh, Carla comes along and uh, it just wants another website that is like two giga. And then now you just kind of put it there, right? It's like four gigabyte and you already took three. So what are you gonna do? Like, are you gonna move? like the one of Bob away, or you just like waste the one gigabyte. So essentially, there is a problem of sharing the resources of the servers. You're gonna have a bunch of websites or web apps 
or uh, backends that you need to put on your servers. And then you have to decide where to put and how to allocate. And so the solution to this problem is virtual servers. So you don't have any more physical servers. The physical servers, they exist, but you, you divide them in virtual servers. So instead of having one server with a four gigabyte of RAM, you have four virtual servers running on the same machine, but each one of them has one gigabyte. And then you just uh, give like them to the people that needs it. So virtual servers have been around for a very long time, and they just add a lot of names. At the beginning, they were just called the virtual machines. And so there were programs like uh, VMware and all other type of like uh, ad hoc solutions. And uh, as developers, we didn't hear from them because they were usually done in uh, bigger data centers. But then Amazon came along with the Amazon Cloud, and then it just invented this new unit of measure called instances. And so on Amazon, there are instances, okay? When you have like a Amazon EC2, it's still like a physical server. There's like one physical server, but then maybe there is like six virtual machines, but they're called instances. And then uh, new technologies came along. And so, for example, uh, Docker and Kubernetes, they just divide the machines in containers. And then uh, there's like other solutions, like, for example, Heroku, that it divides the machine in uh, dinos. Okay, so like one server has many dinos, and then you pay for some of them. <clears throat> and so the next step of like the unit of a virtualization is a functions. And so Amazon Lambda is an, a new service uh, available uh, from 2014 on the, um, uh, on the Amazon cloud, where the unit of computation is functions. So all these types of virtual machines that we just saw, all these types of virtualizations, uh, what's the difference between them? So most of them, they're just like names, but they can be divided somehow based on how deep, how much customization you can do on top of them. <clears throat> so some of them, they are uh, virtual servers, but they are OS level. So for example, when you have a virtual machine, uh, or like a EC2 instance, you can choose if the EC2 instance is going to have Windows or Linux. But then there are some other type of virtualization where the level of customization is lower, so you can only choose at the application level. So for example, on your Heroku, you cannot choose if your server runs on Windows or Linux. You can only choose if your uses uh, Node or Java or PHP. Then the function level is the next step where you choose the application level, but actually you even have to decide in advance uh, which version to use. So for example, Node on AWS Lambda only offers uh, three versions, for example, Node 4, Node 6, and Node 8. So it seems that you're losing a control, but everything becomes simpler because you're not deciding anymore a lot of details of your machines. So this is where serverless comes in. So the first things that everyone thinks when he hears the term serverless, he thinks about the servers. And yes, there are still servers. It's called the serverless, but there are servers. It's just that you care less about it. And the very important stuff and very interesting stuff about serverless is about how much you pay for your servers. And essentially, you. It co uh, serverless cost you nothing to run if nobody is using it. So if nobody is calling your service, you pay zero. And then if you have a million users using it, you pay a million. So it scales from zero to very, very large numbers. There isn't like a minimum amount that you have to pay if you do it, uh, if you do it correctly. So uh, AWS Lambda is kind of like uh, one of the first... Uh, uh, sometimes it depends how you define a serverless, but it's generically considered maybe the first uh, uh, implementation of serverless. So it was released in 2014, and AWS Lambda is also a function as a service. 
So function as a service is just as we said before, that the smallest unit of a virtualization is a function. And then in AWS Lambda, you pay uh, per function execution time. So if you just go online and then you Google AWS Lambda pricing, you're just going to get this page. <coughs> So there is a bunch of AWS Lambda uh, sizes. So let's say that the smallest one is 128. And then this is how much you pay if you execute one Lambda function for 100 milliseconds. So it's a very, very small number. So usually you have multiply this and you, you talk about like price per million. So this is probably something like $2 for 1 million executions or something. But if you make just the two executions, you pay only for those two, which is like a number so small, it's not even a cent. So, and the, the nice things about AWS Lambda is that from 2014, Amazon has already iterated a lot on it. So Amazon Lambda already supports uh, Node JavaScript, Java, Python, .NET, and Go. There is a lot of other uh, frameworks or like uh, platforms that they do support serverless. And before we were talking about, for example, there is a Google Cloud Function, IBM Watson, and then a lot of other companies they're getting on these. So, for example, there is a Cloudflare just like launched their own version, but they are all very new. So while AWS Lambda has been around already for five, four years and it starts to have a very big ecosystem, the others are kind of like the new arrivals and they are a little bit more um, bleeding edge. Uh, so today we're just gonna use AWS Lambda, which is what I use in production. And then, uh, yeah, you will be able to do, make your own choice uh, about what, uh, which platform you actually want to use. So uh, AWS Lambda in the end is just a function. And uh, since we're using Node, is a JavaScript function. So in Node, you have this part, export handler, which is just is just like exporting the function to another file. And this is the actual function. Yes. So in AWS Lambda, you just receive some parameters. The event, it contains input parameters. And then the context is used to do output. So if we just want to do an hello world, we just use context and do context.satseed and then return hello world. Yeah, so in practice, uh, this is nice, but how, how does it look when I actually have to write AWS Lambda? So you go on, uh, on Amazon and then you log in in the console, okay? So it would look like this. You just visit Amazon and then you do sign in to console. And then you're gonna be inside and then you have your own uh, dashboard. Here you just look for Lambda. Because, yeah, because um, Amazon has really a lot, a lot of services. So you can do all sorts of stuff and you must uh, search by name. Otherwise, you will never find Lambda across like the thousands of uh, other stuff you can do on Amazon uh, Cloud. So this is just like a bunch of uh, AWS uh, Lambdas that I use in production for my uh, for my servers and here I have one that I already created it to create a new one is very easy you just do create a new function and then here they ask you a bunch of stuff like the permission we choose the version here so here we choose a node 8 but then we can choose all these other stuff there's like one go version java 8 and then there's like python so we choose node 8 and then we have to choose an existing role. And then here we are lucky, I just created one already. This is just like boring stuff for permission. And then we have to give a name, which is say, hello world two. So here there is a bunch of like customization you can do from this interface. And then as a developer, you actually don't come here, but it's just nice to have it if you'd like to look deeply into stuff. So if you want to write a very simple, uh, function and you just want to do it from here from the browser they even uh, plays uh, this kind of like a small editor so you can just write directly here and uh, we're just gonna copy paste our um, our function here uh, 
and then it's because all right so then we have to save it and then you can test it here we just have to we just have to define an event but we really don't care about what event we're passing so let's say test now yes and it worked here he responded for hello world so this is really not interesting uh, for real world scenarios because essentially we're just like printing in the console right so it's like if we did a hello world in any other language so how do we actually use uh, AWS Lambda to write like a real a real web server where we're returning an HTML file. So we can AWS Lambda is all about execution. So you only execute something from an event, and then if you actually want to answer back to HTTP call, you have to use another uh, Amazon service called called Amazon API Gateway. So Amazon API Gateway, it maps, the, it maps HTTP calls to AWS Lambda. So what it does, it just it generates for you an endpoint that if you call that endpoint, uh, the endpoint is going to call the AWS Lambda and then return back the results. So in this example, it generated is always going to be this, this very long uh, URL, like execute dash app dot US East dot Amazon. And then here at the beginning, there is just going to be a new code that is your very application. And of course, this is not, you're not going to give this to your customers, but then there is even other uh, Amazon services that you use, or you just use your own DNS to map your, your real uh, domain to um to end the point on this so <clears throat> as you've seen have you have, as you have seen it's kind of like complicated to manually create aws lambda you would have to write and click a lot inside of um, of the amazon console so what you actually do is that you use a framework or a tool that actually puts together all these parts for you and it just lets you write uh, a little bit of JavaScript uh, to do to do the whole things. So yes, so essentially we need a tool for the job, and uh, we need to do uh, two main things. One is that we need to get our code, we need to zip it, and then we need to upload it to Amazon. And then on Amazon we need to create a AWS Lambda from the code, and then to map it to all API gateway endpoints. And so the de facto standard in serverless is this framework that is also called serverless. So this is a bit confusing because serverless is serverless computing is the whole idea that we just described. But if you write it capitalized like this, then you're talking about the framework. And when we're talking about the framework is essentially serverless is a website is serverless.com. And then if you visit it, it's going to tell you how to use this serverless framework. So you have to a little bit pay attention if you're talking about this philosophy of serverless or if you're talking about this very framework that is also called the serverless. And the serverless is very nice. It deploys a zip and then is also a node JavaScript NPM package. So it's very, very easy to install. What you have to do is essentially, if you're familiar with Node, but otherwise it's very easy, you open the terminal on Mac OS 6, or you open the Microsoft uh, uh, command prompt on Windows, and then you install Node, you just download the Node install from the website, and then you just do npm install serverless. All right, and then you will download it and will install it locally in your folder project. So, how actually is a serverless application uh, structured? So I have it here already open. I use Atom. Atom is a very simple editor to write uh, node applications. So I went ahead and I created a folder and uh, this folder is just going to represent my service, which is uh, 
JSON REST API service. Inside of it, to configure serverless, you have to create a serverless.yaml. This is a configuration file that tells a serverless what is supposed to deploy to the Amazon cloud. So here is the file. I'm going to make it bigger. So the file is supposed to be YAML, but you can also use a JSON instead. YAML is this other uh, format that it doesn't have a lot of uh, space, uh, a lot of uh, quotes and stuff. But me personally, I like uh, JSON, and I think uh, you, I'm, you're not afraid of making mistakes with spaces and stuff. So in this YAML file, you just uh, give a name to your service, and then you have to define the provider. The provider it means essentially where you deploy it in which cloud. So here we're deploying it on Amazon. We're using a node 8. And then we're deploying it in the uh, United States Easter one region in uh, North Virginia. And then the size of this Lambda is going to be 128. If you want to use another cloud provider, Google kind of already works with this. That's why there is this provider specification. So you can use Google. You could probably also use IBM. Uh, Watson or other stuff. I, I didn't try though personally. And then uh, here you define your functions. So here there is a functions and then it's a little bit verbose here, but essentially there is a function. I named it index and then this handler, it means um, which, which file is the main file of the function. Which file should I call? And these are the events that should trigger this function. So to be read essentially is like this. Every time I receive an HTTP GET on uh, on these two uh, on the on the root uh, on the root um, uh, folder, I should call this handler.index. Okay. So this handler.index is going to be actually a file. So in our uh, folder here we have a file called handler.js. So this handler here is going to call handler.js. And then inside of handler.js, we're going to get a function called index. OK? So it's just like a generic function. And here is actually our code that we're going to use to, to build a, a simple uh, REST JSON API endpoint. So we're still going to use, you see, this is the AWS Lambda function. We got the context. And here we do context.succeed. And then uh, here we are passing a response. The response is HTTP status 200. And then the body is these uh, articles, which is just like a bunch of data. Uh, in this case, like we're, we're using um, a blog as a use case. And then in the blog, there is only one article post. And then the title is awesome title. And then the content is awesome content. So. First of all, one of the very nice things of serverless is that he has a lot of plugins. And one of the basic things that you would want to do first is run this locally. You don't want to push this to the cloud immediately. And this sounds like a very trivial thing, but serverless is one of the few frameworks that will let you do that. A lot of other newer frameworks on Google or Cloudia.js, they, they don't have yet this very basic feature. And uh, um, on serverless, you can have plugins. And uh, we have, I have installed this plugin called serverless offline, which simply let us run this, uh, this function locally on our computer. So essentially, we need to uh, go inside of the folder where we're building our projects. And then we have to call. Let's see, because I also don't remember it always by heart. Yes, is serverless offline start. So this, it will launch a local server. So here we got the local host. And uh, here we're getting the JSON, uh, the JSON answer. OK, so already with this, we have essentially built a uh, a REST API JSON first endpoint. The difference to real code, it would be that we wouldn't be using mock, mock data hard coded here, 
but we would be uh, making a call to a database. So we would be calling uh, MySQL or MongoDB to fetch the data and then to answer back the code. So this is nice, but uh, you know, in Node or in any other language that you're using, uh, you already have your very nice frameworks, right? So in Node, you have uh, uh, Express, and then in Python, you have Django, and so on and so on. So it's not really nice that we're actually, uh, that we would have to change all our code just to uh, be able to run on AWS Lambda. So what happens actually later, oh, maybe it's easier if I do like this. Ah. Uh, after 20 minutes of being uh, uh, like <laughs> the hunchback, uh, finally, all right. Uh, <laughs> so um, what what we're actually going to do is that then you use a framework that maps AWS Lambda to uh, to the framework that you want to use. The Amazon team created this this library called AWS Serverless Express. Express is a framework for Node that is very popular. And so essentially, you will be able to use your express code, but on AWS Lambda. It's just essentially doing that from intermediary. So what's going to happen here is that this is like a bunch of uh, magic code. So we're just like importing AWS Serverless Express. And then here in app.js is going to be our express node app. Okay. And then just like this puts together. So this one actually is not that interesting code. I just like copied from the GitHub. But then the interesting part is that now all this code up here that it was like a custom AWS Lambda code, we move it into this file app.js. And then now here, we're just writing normal express uh, code. We have this app.get, app.get articles. And then uh, this is probably the same case for any other language. You're just going to have to find the library that, uh, that does this intermediary step for you. And that, that's also why it's nice to use AWS Lambda, because you're going to find these, these proxy libraries for AWS Lambda. But maybe no one wrote uh, a Google uh, Function Express uh, uh, library yet. Uh, so now that we wrote like this, and it's very nice, essentially if you have a Node Express app, you can just put it there. And one of few of the limitations though is that uh, you have to be careful about, uh, no, no, yes, you have to be careful about the file system because uh, when you get your function, what happens is that uh, all this code here is going to be zipped and then send it to Amazon. So if your code, it calls local files, let's say that you call a file outside of this folder, that file is not going to be there on the server, right? So that's the only limitation of Express. You have to care about which files they're going to go in the, in the final bundle to the server. So now we, we have built all our application. And then a nice part is that to deploy it, we also use serverless. And then we call serverless deploy. So I'm actually this part. I uh, let's see let's see where, where it goes because essentially the first time that you do serverless deploy is a bit slow. It like it takes five minutes or stuff. And then the times up because it's creating all your projects on Amazon. The times after is like really, really faster and it takes around like 30 seconds on a normal connection. But what's happening here is that serverless here, here you see the serverless folder. What it's doing is that it's getting all these files and then it zips them here. And then maybe it's interesting to go to see what's inside of the zip. So here you see, here's the source code and then there's this dot serverless and then we're gonna mess up with it. We're going to open the zip is building just to see what's inside. Maybe everything explodes, but yes. So, and then inside there is again the same files. Okay. It just like took all the files and then it zipped them. It's because we're using all of them. Sometimes you're just using some and then you will just put some of them. The interesting stuff is that also all the dependencies will be bundled. So if you're using other libraries, all the libraries, they must go inside of this bundle. Otherwise, on the Amazon cloud, there isn't going to be any 
fetching on uh, libraries or like other build stuff happening later. Everything needs to go into this uh, zip bundle. Yeah, so this is again, it's just the same things. So one, one of the things that you see when you think about lambda is that there are lambda and they're called the function. And then you think that each microservice should be the equivalent of a function in your code. But in practice, it's really not like that. What happens is that a lambda function is equivalent of a service, okay? So going back to this file here, serverless, as you notice, I only created the one function. I could have created the 100 function. I could have created a function for each HTTP endpoint. But this is just very confusing and it becomes very messy very quickly. So even though you can do this, in practice, if you're building web servers, you don't do it. What you do is that you, you create this generic, you use this proxy plus, is just, it means it's a wild card and it means any call I receive from any endpoint, just use this one function. And then this one function in the handler here is going to be mapped to express. So in the end, we're really not doing functions. We're doing services, you know, in the end. But the good things is that then we have all the power of Lambda and these services, they can scale up and down very fast. So we, we build essentially a REST JSON API in this case. If we go back here, here we could just like add a lot more of these endpoints. So let's say that you have a resource called articles, and then you have a resource called the user, and then here you would do something like you would have a call to your DB. So you, you would do like DB query users or something, okay? And here there is a connection to your database. And this is fairly easy. It's like quite intuitive to migrate from from other ways to AWS Lambda. The things that uh, it's less intuitive is if you have a single web application, so you have a single uh, single web single page web application written, uh, for example, in Angular or in React. So then what's happening is that, uh, how do you make it return those files? And uh, there, are, there are some different options. So one of the options is that you don't use AWS Lambda, what you use is Amazon S3 buckets, which is just like a bunch of, uh, it's like if you take the files of your uh, uh, Angular application and you just uh, host, host it on, a, on Amazon S3, all right? And uh, it's kind of like if you had a FTP server in the past, you have just like a bunch of static files and this is an option. Another option instead is that you still use AWS Lambda, but you use it only to generate the initial index.html file. Inside of the index.html file, you will call all the CSS and JavaScript, and this is going to be deployed on S3. And uh, this is a little bit more advanced, but it's, for example, what I'm doing. So here, this is actually all the code from my Waitario uh, SaaS product. And here I have a, a folder called the app, which is my web app. And then here I have my serverless.yaml. As you can see, it's like much longer. Yes, it's doing a lot more stuff than hello world that we saw. But then the important part here is the plugins. So I'm using this plugin called serverless S3 deploy. So what it does is that it takes all your single uh, page application code build it with Angular or React, and then it deploys it to S3 for you. And then you call it from your index.html. Here I have an index.html, and then here I have this part. Where is it? Here. I have, I'm using Webpack, which is like a bundler builder to, for React. And then here you can see I'm generating, I'm generating on the go the, the, the JavaScript names, and this URL is going to be hosted, is going to be a URL to S3. So these are a bit more advanced stuff. It took me a few weeks to actually play 
with Lambda to manage to do this. To do REST API JSON is like much easier, but this one you have to play a little bit more. Um, all right, and uh, so Lambda Lambda sizes. So Lambda comes with a lot of different sizes from 128 megabyte to 3008 megabyte. They call it, uh, this unit of measure should be RAM memory. But in theory, is actually, you cannot choose, uh, you cannot choose the CPU or uh, the type of hard disk that you have on the Lambda. Everything is standard. All the 128 are identical. And uh, if you choose an instance that is 256, it's just going to have a double of all the resources of 128. So if you choose a 256 megabyte, it's going to have double CPU as well. It's going to have a double network and bandwidth. And also, it's going to cost double. But then it's going to be double fast. So you have to choose based on your application. Do you want a, a very, very fast car that costs a lot, or you want a very slow car that is very cheap? And then sometimes it doesn't matter. All right. An another very interesting stuff with Lambda is that you can deploy very small services and essentially not pay for it. So when you deploy them online, if no one calls them, you're not going to pay for it. So if you make your own blog and you put it online, you don't pay for it because, I mean, unless you have a lot of users already, but no one will visit you. But uh, anyway, uh, one of the things, though, that you can do later on is that while, uh, if you're familiar with the term monolith versus microservices, so monolith is essentially a huge application. You have everything inside just one server. So you have, for example, your REST API endpoints, and then you have your landing pages, and you have your web app, and you have your dashboard, and it's all together. It's just like one server running. This was happening a lot in the past with like enterprise stuff with, the, I don't know, Java and stuff. But another way to do this is using essentially microservices. You split the huge monolith in a lot of the smaller applications that they are supposed to do only one thing. And usually is one. Every team inside of the company is responsible for only one of the microservices. So if there is a microservice doing login, then the team does only that. And then there is a microservice doing something else, and they all talk to each other. And Lambda is, is really great because essentially, yes, actually here I was going a little bit more in depth, yeah. So the monolith, to make an example of what is a monolith, is that if you have your website and your website is just called example, you would have www.example.com and then you would have all your landing pages and it would be calling the monolith server. And then if you have, for example, REST JSON APIs, this would be still in the same, you know, it would just like be a different endpoint. And then if you have a single web uh, page application written in Angular, it would still be on the same server. Instead, the difference with microservices is that you take all these different tasks and then you split them. One very easy way to do that is, uh, at the beginning, is that you split them uh, by functionality. So all the landing pages usually is better if you write them uh, in something that is like server-side rendered for performance. So you kind of do like the classic uh, PHP templating on the server. And then you are going to have www.example.com, and then uh, he's going to call this like very easy templating uh, service, okay, on uh, AWS Lambda, for example. And then you're going to have this api.example.com is another server, which it could be another AWS Lambda. And then this one is completely different. It's doing like a lot of calls to the database and then returning JSON data. And then you have app.example.com which, for example, is a single web page application that it requires login. So it's going to be a, a giant a bundle of like JavaScript and the CSS and stuff. So serverless and microservices are not the same things, but they are two concepts that they really work well together. And the good things as well is that if you have a monolith hub, and then let's say that there is only one part of your server that is called a lot, you will need to scale everything. So if your APIs are called a lot, you will need to scale it 10 times. But what, what will happen is that in each of, of the times that you scale it, you will also have a lot of stuff that you don't need. 
like you will have the landing pages that no one calls or, or other stuff. And the good things is that this way you essentially have a free internal dashboards. So if you have a lot of before later when you expand a company, you're gonna need to have some internal dashboard to manage your users or to do custom analytics or something else. And what happens is that even if only internal employees they use this, you will still pay servers in the cloud and you will waste uh, uh, money on this. Instead, this way, you will deploy it as a AWS Lambda, and then maybe your employees, they will make like one call or two per day, which will be essentially, it will cost nothing. And so, yeah, another point of uh, serverless is that as usual, you know, the famous sentence is computer sciences, there is no silver bullet. Have you ever heard uh, this sentence, no silver bullet? So it started, this is because in cowboy movies, or I don't know where it comes from, but there was the hero that uh, he had the silver bullet, he put it in his gun and then he could kill anyone, he could kill vampires and werewolves. So it was like a magic wand to fix everything. And then there was a famous paper about computer science saying that there is no technology as cool as it seems that when it comes out, it can fix any problem. You know, every tool has its pro and cons. So serverless, as usual, is no silver bullet, and it has its advantages. So, for example, you have you spend less time deploying and managing one service, but then, for example, you will usually spend more time managing multiple microservices because you will need to make them. You need the orchestration between all the microservices. So. This it will be better because essentially you will have reached a, a bigger a bigger level. You will be able to do more things, but it's not that now everything will be easy and stuff. There will be like new problem to make a, a even better architecture. So a migration path that I took personally and I think it's a it's a great idea is essentially to rewrite small parts of your application, and it's really good to rewrite internal dashboards. Because if you break those, uh, your customers are not going to know, just like other people from your team are going to know. And then it's great. They will be pissed off. But then when you break them, they will come to you and then you will know. And then it will be fine. So what I did, for example, is that if you have dashboard.example.com and it's part of the, your monolith app, what you, what you do is that you just take this one and then you take it out. You take it out from your current deployment and then you make it a separate uh, AWS uh, Lambda service. So a uh, few cool uh, concepts that they're coming. So serverless is actually only the beginning is really, and there is like a lot of promises of what can happen. And one of the things, one of the cool new terms of serverless is serverless at the edge. So what does it mean at the edge? So you might have heard of things called CDN as a content delivery networks. So what happens with content delivery networks is that if you have, let's say that you have a YouTube video, okay? YouTube, what YouTube does is that it takes this video and then it spread it across a network of servers and it sends it to Australia, to France, to Japan. And then when customers want to see this video, they don't call the server of YouTube in California they call the closest server in the network. And this one was possible because uh, files are very easy, you know? There's like one video, you just spread it, all right? But to do this with servers, it's much more complicated. And it would cost a lot because you would need to run a server in Australia, a server in Japan, a server in United Kingdom. There would be a lot of servers. But instead, with serverless, if no one calls your servers, you don't pay anything. So you can put your code everywhere around the world, and then if no one from Australia calls it, it's fine. So this is the next idea, is that all the code will be spread across at the edge, at all the servers around the world. This is still, is still like a new concept, and it's, it's like something that the, uh, people are working on, and um, Yes, also, like, while serverless already can do that, like, when I did the deploy, I said the US East one, I could have just, like, deployed to, I don't know, like, the Australia region. The problem is that we don't have yet uh, serverless databases. 
So databases, they are not really serverless yet. When you run them, you need to keep them on. And so there are like there are new solutions that they are actually making serverless databases. So there is Amazon making a few of them and also Google, but they're like in the early stage and they're still uh, figuring uh, things out. So this is like a, a pro tip. Maybe you're, you're already using this, but this is a stuff I, I found myself. I'm a developer. I was not using Amazon. I was using Heroku, which is like a simpler version to deploy code online. And I discovered things. If you go online and you just want to deploy some code, all right, I'm going to go on Google and then I'm just going to write serverless tutorial. So what's going to happen is that here we're actually kind of lucky because we found like two results that are like not Amazon. But the point is that Amazon made a lot of documentation and this documentation is usually very long and boring and uh, you actually don't get to write any code. So what you actually want to do is that on, on Google, I don't know if you knew this, but if you do site semicolon and then you, you can specify a website. So on medium.com, there is all the cool tutorials. They just make you do the stuff. They, they don't talk and talk like I did today. They just <laughs> make you write code. So when you write these, you just get it here. Basic serverless tutorial with node, bam. And then you just go here and the right, there is going to be some interaction. But then here comes the code. You're going to write code. It's not like you're going to spend the time reading uh, docs and stuff. And uh, yeah. Yeah, so I wanted uh, to say a lot. Uh, uh, thank you to Link Value and then Joy for helping us organize the event and then uh, also for the free food uh, later on. And uh, yeah, that's it. I don't know if you guys have uh, any questions, if you want to ask something in particular about serverless. Otherwise, we'll speak uh, later on. Yeah? Of the price. So essentially, the price, uh, it's, that's the problem with Amazon, is, uh, is that if you, if you have zero customers, you will have zero, all right? But if you have 1,000, it's going to scale to 1,000. What happens if overnight you have millions of customers and then you're going to end up with a huge bill? So Amazon, yes, this is not a problem specific to AWS Lambda, but uh, what you have to do is that uh, you need to run. Uh, that's why you have to start with uh, small services that are not important and you see how much you're spending and you get an idea, right? Because no one knows how many millions of calls you usually get. And then on Lambda, on Amazon, you have a bunch of features here. So in the building, here, they have a dashboard called the building. And then in this one, you can set up, like you have reports, and you can set up alerts. So what you do is that you start it, and then you put an alert. When I spend more than 50 euros, just like send me an SMS. Or what you also can do is that you can limit, you can say, Look, if, if this stuff spends more than 100 euro, just like cut it, right? Because maybe you, you mess up something. This is like your blog. Something bad happens. You know, you don't want to see like a thousand euro on your credit card uh, from Amazon. It's not probably not going to happen, but so you, it's, you can put uh, limits. And uh, yeah, there's Amazon has a lot of tools. Um, if this is your first, so this is a good idea. If you already have like a quick deployment and you want to do it better, me I, I used to use Heroku, this other service which I really recommend to start. And Heroku is is a simpler version, developer friendly, and it's also it's also kind of like a yeah. Now I'm inside of the dashboard. I have to log out, but it's really nice. The only problem with the Heroku is that. You write code, you push it, and then you have to pay 25 euro per month, even if you don't have users for every instance, you know? And so it's, it's really good to start because at the beginning it, it doesn't matter, but then when you start to have bills of like, I don't know, more than 200 euro, you, you can switch. Uh, but it might take years, literally, so if you're starting a startup or stuff. And uh, yeah. Yep. 
even with the microphone. Yeah, yeah. Thank Ten you. people. <laughs> so if you require some, like, I don't, I don't know, maybe like a hundred of libs in your, in for your, for your apps. Uh, yes. What's the, what's the start time for? For, for the app. Yeah. Yes. So one, one stuff, I didn't spend much time talking about it because Amad, uh, Lambda has a bunch of prob like uh, restrictions, limitations that you have. In my personal opinion is that people worried a lot about stuff that then didn't matter. So every time that a Lambda function has to start, there is a container starting, okay? And then there is like a little bit of time that is going to be wasted on that. Usually people care a lot about this. When you see it in production, it doesn't matter. Like unless you're like Google or like, but if you're just like a, a normal startup and then your application is not huge, it's not going to be the cold start. It's not going to be very important. And uh, wait, tell me again your question. I don't know if I went uh, out okay, of So if you have a uh, hundred of libs to, yes. uh, like, I mean, to compile and... Yes. Just to, uh, so you compile them in advance and then you zip them and then you send them, okay? So... This, it could, you have to kind of like try it to see how it goes. If you have a very big bundle, okay, or your application is very heavy, it might uh, it might be slow to start. They, there is a bunch of like, again, if you go and you do the trick, side medium, and then you write like serverless uh, start performance. There's like a bunch of blog posts that they compare the performances by size. And Node and Go are very fast, but Java and... Uh, uh, C sharp are not as fast. Uh, they have a slower uh, start. So lambda is not necessarily good for for everything. You have to try it a bit. And um, yeah, if in Java you get a very big bundle, it might be that then it takes I don't know one or two seconds to one. You know, I, I'm not sure. It depends. So this is my experience I had with Node in production. Then you actually have to see. Well, how it goes for you, yeah. yeah. Yeah? Uh, is there uh, such a pro uh, platform for company which doesn't want to host uh, their, code in their code in the cloud? Yes. So, if so, one of the very interesting things is that actually Amazon started this, but a lot of other companies are doing it. And technically, you could even build your own serverless platform. IBM did a platform on IBM Watson, okay? And then it's called IBM OpenWhisk. IBM OpenWhisk. So what they did is that they have their own implementation that you can use, but it's also open source. So if you want to run it on-premise on your own data center stuff, you just take this software and you do it. Under what we have seen, AWS Lambda, they just call it containers. So I, I don't think they use Docker or Kubernetes, but it's, it's technically serverless. It's just another layer on top of containers. You could just like take all your containers in your companies and then you put this layer on top. I think it's very early to try to, unless you really, the only focus of your, comp of your startup is to build one of these systems, then you could do it. If you just if you're in your company and you would like to use this, I think this IBM uh, OpenWhisk is like too early. It's like very new. I don't think you you could actually do it now, but maybe in a couple of years you could do it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Work. Yeah. All good. All right. Yeah. So thank you very much for coming and uh, yeah, speak later. Thanks. <laughs>